praise and thanks to God Almighty for allowing us to get up and come once again to be able to uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. We have taken these past uh, few weeks a break from our lessons in the book of Acts. We've been going through the book, book of Acts. Uh, we are right now in Acts chapter number 13, and we have paused in that uh, in that series because of COVID-19 and we wanted to take a little bit of time and look at some lessons that might be encouraging to us. And so today we are stuck listening on the news, on CNN, MSNBC, all the stations. You have various COVID response teams. You hear from the president. You hear from the treasury secretary. You hear from the health uh, people, the administrators. Then you go down to the state level. Here in California, we hear press briefings from Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, then even down to the city level, you hear press briefings from the city officials about COVID-19. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at one of God's COVID-19 response team members, hmm. one that has been there in the pages of inspiration for years, and we believe that what he experienced is very much applicable to what we are going through on today. If you have your Bibles, please turn them to an Old Testament minor prophet by the name of Habakkuk. Okay. Minor prophet is only in a sense that their writings are shorter. When we often hear or see the term minor prophet, we think of them as somehow being less in stature or less in importance. That is not uh, the meaning of the word minor prophet. It's simply a translational equivalence to the length of the writing itself. And so this one is very short. It's only three chapters. Chapter number one has a total of 17 verses. Chapter number two has a total of 20 verses. Hmm. And chapter number three has a total of 19 verses for a grand total of 56. 56 passages that are so big and so important that we would like to spend a little bit of time on them this morning. Okay. When you look at the prophet Habakkuk, he was coming in a very turbulent time. The balance of power was shifting from the Assyrians to the Babylonians. In fact, the Babylonians had later conquered Assyria, which their capital was Nineveh, which we know of because that's where Jonah went to speak. We believe that Habakkuk wrote before the fall of the temple because he talks about Judah in the present tense. And so as we look at what he wrote and what his issue was, there's something that we notice right away. Even though the times were turbulent, even though there was violence, even though there was famine, even though there was poverty, even though there was corrupt, uh, uh, corrupt people in the government, Habakkuk never went back to the people to encourage them to change their ways. Mm. He never spoke to the people on God's behalf. Instead, the entire three chapters are devoted around a conversation that he had with God. He took his complaint, he took his petition, based on what he saw in the world, straight to God. And if you look at the structure of Habakkuk, you'll find there are two complaints in chapters 1 and 2. And then conversely, God answers him. 
in those two complaints. And then the third chapter basically is where he comes to an understanding of the things that are going on in his world. And the third chapter there, those 19 verses, are essentially a poem. And so for this morning, we believe that the application that we have by Habakkuk's conversation with God is very germane to what we are experiencing right now in the world. So if you don't mind, I would like to have you go now to Habakkuk chapter number one, and we're going to do a little read. It's important for us to read because we want to make sure that we understand that this is not just some man's words, but actually what we find in the Holy Scriptures. So the first complaint of Habakkuk we find in Habakkuk chapter number 1, verse 1 through 4, where he says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not say, Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Mm. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceeded. Hmm. If you look at Habakkuk's first complaint, he notices the corrupt nature of his government. He notices how the law of God or the rule of God or the, the ways of God have now been set aside by many of the people. He's noticing that how even the government officials, even the religious rulers, have shied away from the word of God. He says, the word of God is now slack. There is only violence. There is only corruption. Because what he was seeing and what he was experiencing was no different than what we see today. Where we see disproportionate uh, uh, nature of how this COVID violence, this COVID pandemic, pandemic is affecting various people. You see in some countries where the pandemic is running rampant and other countries are doing a lot better. Not every country has ventilators. Not every country has the ability to procure masks. There are some places in the world that are very desolate, desolate, and not to mention the food shortages that they have. And so as we begin to look at Habakkuk, and as we begin to understand the nature of his complaint, he said, wait a minute, God, I'm a godly person. I trust you. I believe you. I love you. But I can't deal with what I'm seeing. And I've prayed to you and prayed to you and prayed to you, and you haven't answered. So I have a complaint, God. I want to talk to you personally. I want to hear from you directly because of the sorrows that I see. Sometimes, brethren, just as our friend Job did, when we ask God a question, we have to be prepared to receive his answer. Mm. So God answers the first complaint. He said, Behold, Ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. So God says, wait a minute, Mr. Habakkuk. I see what's going on. I understand what's happening in the world. I see that the judgments of the people, of the leaders, of the ministers, of the teachers is not right in my eyes. But I have a plan. And I'm going to raise up a people. I'm going to raise up some that are going to come and make be my enemies, if you will, not enemies, but be my vessel in which I will uh, enact my judgment. So we see here that Habakkuk 
was looking around and worrying instead of looking up and listening mm. and then looking ahead and believing. Mm. So when we get into the second complaint, we go to Habakkuk chapter number 1, verse number 12. Excuse me. He says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. And Almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and cannot look upon iniquity. Whereof, wherefore, look, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, mm. and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. Wow. And just for the sake of time, let me paraphrase. Habakkuk hears the response of God. And he basically says, oh God, wait a minute, not the Chaldeans. They're worse than we are. Mm -hmm. God, you're, you're making the cure be worse than the problem. Because the Chaldeans at that time, or the Babylonians at that time, were a nation of people that it was uh, known historically that they would come through and wipe the land clean. They would burn trees. They would burn forests. They would burn buildings down. They would rape women. They would conquer the whole land and not just conquer it. They didn't leave a twig left when they were done. When the Chaldeans or Babylonians went through and conquered the land, it looked like it was a scene out of a Holocaust, Holy, uh, Holocaust movie. So the, the prophet here is saying, wait a minute, God. Your response to the COVID uh, things that I'm dealing with is more powerful than the disease itself. And so he complains to God about this. But once again, we have to be careful when we complain to God that we pay attention to his answer. Amen. And I want to fast forward now. Because Habakkuk is talking to God or having a conversation with God. It says, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay nations? He's talking about the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. And then he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. And I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I shall answer when I am approved. In other words, he said, wait a minute, God. I've got a problem with your method of justice. Hmm. I've got a problem with how you're handling this situation. I cried out to you, and you answered me. But the answer was kind of rough. And so now, God, I'm, I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to basically build a tower on the side of the wall if I have to, but I'm going to wait for you to answer me because this is not right either. We've got a problem here, but now you are heaping more sorrow onto the problem. Mm. So let's see how God answers him. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth. Notice it doesn't say he that readeth and run. It says he that he may uh, run that readeth it. <laughs> for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, in other words, though it might take a little while, God told Habakkuk, wait for it, mm. because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Basically, if you go through and read the rest of chapter number two, God is saying that I'm going to deal with the Babylonians. The Babylonians are coming and they are going to serve a purpose for me. And yes, they're bad. Yes, they're evil. Yes, they're heavy handed. But don't worry about the Babylonians. Because what they do is they feed off of strife. They feed off of worry. They feed off of stress. Mm -hmm. But God is telling him, don't worry about any of that. Because at the end of the day, I'm going to take care of the Babylonians. So now let's go into chapter number three, where we begin to see where Habakkuk has his understanding. If we go into Habakkuk chapter number three, and I, for the sake of time, again, cut it down to only a, a few 
uh, a few uh, passages. Habakkuk chapter number 3, verse number 1. The prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, unto Shigenoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath. Remember mercy. Drop down to verse number 13. Thou wentest forth for the salvation of thy people, and even for salvation with thy anointed. Here is a messianic reference to Christ Jesus. In other words, Habakkuk is saying, even your anointed one will be safe during these times. Thou woundest the head of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation unto the next, Selah. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, mm. and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Mm -hmm. I will joy in the God of my salvation. So what is the principle, what is the lesson that we did with all of this reading? God told Habakkuk that the vision was for an appointed time in the future. God told Habakkuk that it might be slow in coming, but wait for it. God told Habakkuk that I will bring the Babylonians down. God told Habakkuk, don't worry about the situation that you're living in. Don't worry about the remedy that I'm giving you. Just take this medicine right now because at the end of the day, it's going to be all right. When we look at what happens in that chapter number three, you'll see God give, chapter number two, you'll see God gives Habakkuk five woes. He says, woe to the neuter. That's Habakkuk chapter number two, verse six through eight. Woe to the deceitful. Habakkuk chapter number two, verse nine through 11. Woe to the violent, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 12 through 14. Woe to the shameful, Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse 15 through 17. And woe to the idolaters, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 18 and 20. And each one of those categories, if you really dig into it deeply, you'll find that God is speaking to the corrupt nature of the people, the corrupt nature of the leaders, the corrupt nature of the government. He was speaking to all of these in those woes. And so how do we draw a parallel in this most powerful lesson? Number one, there was a petition to God. But then number two, the prophet Habakkuk heard God. He says, I heard, then I stand in awe, and then I'll wait, and then I'll praise, and then I will rejoice. So right now, as we're dealing with the things that are happening in society right now, we're asking ourselves, are we hearing God? Hmm. Are we hearing the word of God? Okay. Then secondly, are we too now standing in awe? Not in awe because of un uh, looking at the problems that we're having, but in awe because God is graciously bringing us through these things. Amen. We focus so much on the death. We so focus so much on the uh, people that have the virus that we're not looking at how many people have recovered. Amen. How many people don't have the virus? How many people are able to function uh, 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 the way they were before this virus came on scene? So are we standing in awe of God because of his crea creation? Because of all he has done for us? And then if we're hearing him and we're standing in awe, are we willing to wait on him? Are we willing to trust that if he brings the Chaldeans or the Babylonians figuratively into your life to uh, execute change, to have you recognize that you still need him, are you willing to wait? Are you willing to wait on God and have patience and say, wait a minute, God, I don't understand this. Mm. You're bringing this dreadful thing on me, but somehow you're telling me that this is going to draw me closer to you. And I don't see it right now, God, because all I see is suffering. All I see is pain. All I see is agony. All I see is death. All I see is people getting on the TV and talking and talking and talking. But right now, God, I just lost my job. Right now, my auntie is sick. Right now, I have relatives that are, that are quarantined. Right now, I have cousins that don't have enough food to eat. 
You're asking me, God, that this is going to somehow be good for me because what you're saying is that now I have to have patience and trust you so that at the end of the day, you're going to deliver me. Amen. This is the application of the lesson that we see in Habakkuk. So he had to hear that gospel news. He had to stand in awe and understand who God was. Then he had to patiently wait on God. And then he began to praise God because he started to look around his life. And he started to look, instead of focusing on the problems and focusing on the bad things, he Come started on. to say, wait a minute, there are some good things in my life. Yes. There are some things that are not uh, affected by COVID-19. There are some things that I can look on that give me hope. So he begins to praise God. Amen. And then the final stage of his kind of recovery is he begins to rejoice. The last verse that we read. He says, I will joy in God. I will have my faith in God. So this morning, we want to focus on Habakkuk chapter number two. And the verse is number four. Because there, God tells Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. Hmm. The just shall live by faith. This is during a time where the Mosaic law was in place. In other words, there were animal sacrifices. There were, there were all manner of things that you had to do that you would worship God. They had the, the priest. They had the temple. They had all these ways that you had to worship God through men. But today, we worship God through Christ Jesus. Amen. So when he says, the just shall live by faith, he was not saying faith in the law. He was saying faith in me, faith in what I'm going to do. Amen. So just as they had to have, Habakkuk had to have faith in that time, we also have to have faith today. Amen. So the question becomes, who is just? Hmm. What does it mean the just shall live by faith? Just is a legal term, as you know here from Palomar. It is talking about a person that has been exonerated, a person that has been declared innocent, a person where an authority or a judge has looked upon your life or looked upon your crimes or looked upon your sin and has stamped on you that you are now exonerated. So the just, those that believe in God, those that trust in God, those that have obeyed the gospel, those are the just ones. And we find this we begin to look in the scriptures, we find this in several places. First of all, we find it in the book of Romans. The chapter is number one. And if you go to verse number 16, the apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto mm -hmm. salvation. Yes. In other words, the gospel message is the road, it's the vehicle, it's the method towards your salvation. It's not what you think. It's not your opinion. It's not how you feel. It's not a feeling. The power is in the gospel. Amen. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's start over. Romans chapter number 1, verse number 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel Amen. of Christ. Amen. For it, singular, solo, for it is the power of God unto salvation. For everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17 is where we want to go. For therein, amen, somebody. Therein, amen. in the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God. Amen. Why? Because he recognized that through the law, you could not be, you could not come to him. In other words, the law was perfect, but men were never perfect. Amen. So in the gospel, for therein, verse 17, is the righteousness of God revealed Thank you, Jesus. from faith to faith. The righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel because it is the story, it is the lesson, it is the understanding of why he sent his son. Amen. Because the sacrifice of animals and bulls could not 
wash your sins. It was a way, a method of you showing your teshuva in the Hebrew, to, uh, showing your repentance. But all it did was cover the sin. It did not remove the sin. Yeah. The only thing that can remove the sin from your account with God, again, we're talking about the just. The only thing that could do that was the blood of the Holy One or the Anointed One. Mm -hmm. That's why when you go back to Habakkuk chapter number 3, verse number 13, he says, even your Anointed One or your Anointed. Mm -hmm. He makes a reference to a future exodus of the people out of the world and into the kingdom of God. Amen. It's almost like a second exodus. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Then he says, as is it written. I'm still in Romans 1, 6, 17. As it is written. Now Paul here is quoting Habakkuk. He's quoting Habakkuk chapter number 2, verse number 4. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As is it written, the just shall live by faith. Amen. And for those of us that know and have really been studious, we know that the Roman letter is a very mechanical letter in a sense that it's dealing with the process of salvation. It's, it's not a feel-good, lovey-dovey letter. It, 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 I don't mean that in a negative way, but it is the letter where Paul is very technical. He's, he, he's writing very meticulously about how your salvation is accomplished. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like, it's a manual to explain faith, to explain belief. Because if you really go and you start to understand, he talks about the justification, then he talks about the sanctification, and then he talks about the glorification. Yeah. Those are three processes that are covered in the 16 chapters in the Roman letter. So the just shall live by faith. So how are we applying that when we see, as of yesterday, the United States had 726,000 people that were confirmed of COVID-19 um, cases. When we see that the total deaths worldwide were about 158,000. When we see the total number of testing in the United States is somewhere about 3.6 million. Meanwhile, we have a stimulus, $2 trillion stimulus package that for many people, it boils down to $40 a day. <laughs> if you're waiting on your stimulus check, if you're waiting on that $1,200, it amounts to $40 a day. Are you going to put your trust in $40 a day? Or are the just going to uh, uh, live by faith? Amen. Are you going to live off of that $40 a day and hope that the administration sends you another one? Is that where we're placing our hope? Is that where we're placing our trust? When we, like Habakkuk, are looking out around the world and we're seeing so much death, we're seeing so much poverty, yet we are focused on the wrong things. Amen. When the airline industry gets $25 billion of that money, the airline manufacturers get $17 billion of that money. When you look around, 45% of all child deaths worldwide are related to malnutrition. When you look at 780 million people, or 11% of the world's population, live in extreme poverty of less than $1.90 a day. Mm. When you see at least 17 million children suffer from severe or acute malnutrition around the world, when you see every single day a thousand children, a thousand children, a thousand children every day under the year, under the age of five years old, die from malnutrition. Mm. Say it ain't so. We are seeing what Habakkuk saw. What God is saying, the just shall live by faith. In other words, God is saying, I see what's going on in the world right now. Amen. I know what's happening. But there is going to come a judgment. Mm -hmm. And the, the question for you and I is, are you ready for that? Yeah. Because this is just a taste. 
This COVID-19 is nothing compared to what's going to happen in the day of the Lord. Amen. Jesus said you're going to wish you could run to the hills. Amen. But you won't even be able to be safe in the hills. So are you one of the just that is living by faith? Then we go over to the Galatian letter. Go over to the Galatian letter. Chapter is number 3. Galatians chapter number 3 and meet me at verse number 6. While we explore this concept of the just living by faith. Galatians chapter number 3 verse number 6 says, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Amen, somebody. Amen. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Mm. And the heathen in this context is anybody that's outside of God. He doesn't mean that it's like a derogatory term. It's just a, a, a figurative use of language. Let me repeat that in verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify, there's that word again, the heathen through help, faith, there's a vehicle, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So that they which are of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Amen. Go to verse 10, Galatians chapter 3. For as many as were the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse number 11 is where we want to be. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for or therefore that the just shall live by faith. Amen. So now we see Paul quoting Habakkuk in Romans 1.17. Then years later, he goes over to Galatia and preaches to the saints in Galatia. And he repeats the same theme, knowing that he was a Pharisee, knowing that he probably, based on his training, could quote half of the Old Testament writings by the time he was 12. He knew Habakkuk in, out, up, and down. So in his walk with Christ Jesus, he tells the Romans, or the saints in the Roman letter, Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Then over here in the Galatian letter, Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, the just shall live by faith. So in your COVID-19 world, in your sorrows over losing income, in your sorrows over having a loved one diagnosed, in your sorrows of uncertainty and anxiety and financial stress, how are you going to live? The just shall live by faith. Amen. Because just as God said, I'm going to take care of the Babylonians. They're all that right now. Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, you know, he's coming along and he's a ruthless leader, but I'm going to take care of him. Matter of fact, I'm going to make him end up crawling on all fours. But that's another sermon. <laughs> but for everybody else, are you going to allow your situation to put you in a fight and control you? Or are you going to trust God and live by faith? It's your decision. Go on and look one more time mm. at this concept of the just shall live by faith. Okay. Turn with me over to the Hebrew letter. The Hebrew letter. And we are looking at a spiritual and biblical response to a response team to COVID-19. The Hebrew letter, I want you to meet me at chapter 10. And we'll commence the reading at verse number 30. Hebrews chapter 10. 
For we know him that said, Vengeance belongs to me. Mm. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. I told y'all this current situation ain't going to be nothing to when God comes back to execute judgment. Amen. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of affliction. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and, aff and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. We did a whole series of lessons on the promise. Verse 37. For yet, for yet a little while, and he shall come. Uh, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul should have no pleasure in him. We are, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. So once again, we see in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew writer is also exhorting the saints there. Now, if you look and study the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew letter was written during a time of Christian persecution, where Christians were persecuted. You could literally be uh, uh, drugged out of a building or a home, and you could be put to death. For just believing in Christ Jesus. So the context of the letter provides the soil or the background in which we glean the principles of this particular text. Because in verse 38, he says again, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So once again, when we apply the principles that we learn from Habakkuk, I heard the word of God. I stand in awe of God, I waited on God, I praised God, and I rejoiced in God, then we begin to see the premise, or begin to see how this lesson can be applicable in our lives today. So as we move to a close, I want to go over to uh, Peter, so we can kind of see how this applies in our lives. We go to Galatians, I'm sorry. Let's, let's not go to Peter right now. Let's go to Galatians chapter number 6. Now we'll look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. We have a case where someone from our congregation was in need of food. Right. And a few of us got on the phone and their, their diet or their cuisine was, was more Mexican. Uh, if, if it were me, they would have had, you know, barbecue ribs and you know, <laughs> pork chops, but uh, that's, never mind that. But the menu or the grocery list was given to me. And I was tired. Mm -hmm. I've been working all day. I've been studying. I've been praying. But there was a need. And I'm not focusing on me. I'm not focusing on me. What I'm saying is what the scripture we're reading in Galatians chapter number 6 verse 9 do not grow weary in doing good. Amen. There are some of us right now that are so stressed out and so worried. We're afraid to go to Walmart. We're afraid to go to, to, to the grocery store. Lord have mercy. We're afraid to touch 
the handle on the gas pumps, Lord have mercy. We're sprayed to touch the, the buttons on the ATM thing when you're buying stuff. Don't grow weary in doing good. Make it plain. Make sure that your mind is focused on God. Amen. Make sure that you, you're being clean. We got our hand wipes. Uh, I've got, we've got sanitizer. Brothers have masks on. Do all of those things. But don't let those things consume you. Amen. Because now you're not focused on God anymore. You're focused on stuff. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Then he says, and add to your faith virtue, mm. Mm. which in Latin is casistas, which is purity, honesty, wisdom. It's the opposite of lust. Add to your faith this virtue. Amen. And to virtue, Add knowledge. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing of the word of God. And to knowledge, self-control. This we find is the word temperance, which is, speaks to justice, honor, abstention, self-control. We are not allowing the world to consume you. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. So as we begin to look at how Habakkuk dealt with his problem, now we have at least a roadmap as Christians of how we now can navigate the times that we are living in right now. As we look at this lesson, and we begin to kind of say, well, what about me? What, 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 you know, I, I haven't really obeyed the gospel. I think I'm saved. I, I, I don't really know. Nobody's really explained to me, you know, what I must do to be saved. I mean, I, I think so. I'm a good person. I have morals. I don't cheat. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't, I don't do all those things. So what about me? God loves me too, right? Yes, he does. God loves you so much that he knew that you couldn't save yourself. Yeah. So he sent his son. He sent his son to bear the sins of the world because he was the perfect sacrifice. His blood was clean. It was pure. Amen. It was something that you and I could not bear. There was sin on our ledger. Mm -hmm. It's like the old analogy of the lamp at Walmart. Somebody knocks over a lamp in some little small dusty town in the Midwest. Someone back in headquarters is going to notice that the books are off by one lamp because they ordered so many units, but when all the receipts were tallied up, they were one short. Somebody has to pay for that one lamp. So they'll figure out a way, either by insurance or by bumping up the price another three cents to cover for those broken lamps. The same thing happens with sin in your life. There's an account, there's a ledger, there's a deficit mm. between you and God where somehow, some way, that 3% must be taken care of because God cannot even be in the presence of sin. You cannot fellowship with God while you're dirty. Amen. So he sent his son to pay that 3% Amen. to make sure that there was a way for you and I to get back into koinonia Amen. or fellowship with him. Amen. This is why the power is in the gospel. Amen. Because we read in Romans chapter 1, 16, that is the power of God unto salvation. Paul further articulates the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 1 through 4. More, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Once again, Paul is uh, including the gospel message, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory which I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first, and, first of all, that which I also received, 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the verses number 1 through 4. He said, Brother Williams, why do you give the Bible? Why do you give so many references? <laughs> because we have to make sure that you understand that nothing that comes out of this building is the will of man. Amen. It's nothing but what thus saith the Lord. Amen. Thus saith the Lord is found over 3,000 times in Scripture. And what's happened is we get all these churches that pop up and all these ministers. Everybody's a minister now. You turn on YouTube, you got all kinds of ministers. Wow. But all they're giving a lot of times is opinion, opinion, opinion. We try to stick with the scriptures rightly divided Amen. to make sure that we are indeed honoring God before honoring ourselves. Amen. As we mentioned, Paul declares it again in Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. And you cross reference that in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 16. It says, but they are not, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Hmm. Wait a minute. I thought the gospel was just good news. I thought it was just a story. I thought it was just. Uh, uh, the, 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 the process by which, you know, Christ died and, and he was buried. What, you, you mean I have to obey it? Oh, yeah. There's something I got to do? Go to Romans 10 and 16. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, who has believed our report? That's Isaiah chapter 53, verse number one. What report, Isaiah? Hmm. Isaiah was giving the messianic report of how the anointed one came and he suffered. By his stripes you are healed. Amen. He was marred. He was beaten. He was whipped. You have to obey the gospel. Well, let's go on. What is the gospel? We go on in uh, Hebrews chapter number 4, verse 1 and 2. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, of any shashim to come short of it. We talked about the promise before. The promise goes back to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter 12, the promise was to Abraham's seed. Singular. I'll repeat that. It was to Abraham's seed that all nations will be blessed. The seed is the messianic line that follows through the scripture from Abraham all the way up to the time of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ was the anointed one going all the way back to the book of Genesis in the garden. And so now we're seeing the fruition of what God has done in the gospel. And you go on to Titus chapter number 1, verse number 2, sorry, verse number 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the faith of God's elect, and acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Once again, the promise was given that all nations would be saved. And Christ telling them that they must go in Matthew chapter 28, 18 to 20, up to all nations, preaching and teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So if you are here today and you have not given your life over to Christ, you come by hearing that gospel message. You come by hearing the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And sometimes when you have lessons like today, it deals with our suffering, it deals with our understanding, it deals with how we are to live through a pandemic or a famine or a war. We sometimes forget about the gospel that saves people's lives. Amen. So you come by hearing that gospel message. Then you come by believing that gospel message. You come by repenting of your sins. Again, that word is teshuva. You cannot come to God dirty. Amen. You must repent of your sins. That's godly sorrow, where you are now changing your ways, even if you have it, the capacity in yourself to do it of yourself. You have to make that commitment, and then when you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit guides you into all truth. Amen. That's the sanctification piece we talked about. Sanctification is a lifelong process. Justification is a one-time event. God looks upon you, he sees the blood of Christ, and that 3% is taken care of. That's your justification. Amen. Now you are the just. Then you're living by faith. It's the sanctification where the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to, the paraclete, he comes alongside and begins to work on you so all of a sudden you, have, you don't have that taste to drink anymore. 
Mm -hmm. You don't have the desire when you, when you used to beat on your wife. You'll stop your hand from hitting her. When you used to be lying and cheating, you, you, you'll start to have this, this conscious effect in your life. You say, wait a minute. I don't feel comfortable lying anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable cheating anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable doing all this. That's, that's the Holy Spirit is sanctifying you, which literally means setting you apart. It's taking Amen. you and putting you over here. Amen. It's cleaning you up so that you are ready to be received by God the Father. Amen. That last piece is the glorification. And so come by hearing that gospel message, believing the same, repenting of your sins, being baptized in water. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 38. You go to 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 21. You can go to Acts chapter number 8, verse 34 through 37. If you feel in unity. If you feel in unity, it's reading Isaiah. Mm -hmm. Philip approached the chariot and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? He says, How can I let some man guide me? And so he started right there in Isaiah, teaching him about Christ. And this was a religious man, because if you back up the first part of chapter 8, it says he was coming from Jerusalem from worship. He was a religious man, but he had not obeyed the gospel. And so as they were going, the eunuch said, wait a minute, here's water, what does hinder me? Mm -hmm. I, wait a minute, I want to get baptized too, wait a minute. I need to completely yield myself over to God because I think I got this right. I think I'm doing right. I'm religious. I'm leaving Jerusalem. I was going there to worship. But what are you telling me? You're telling me that I have not been baptized? Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's water right here. What does hinder me from being baptized? Amen. And the Bible tells us they both went down in the water that very hour and were baptized. It's not a sprinkling, it's not a tapping on your forehead, it is immersion into that water grave of baptism. Amen. And that is where the operation is done. I can't explain exactly what happened. It's just water. But I can't explain the same thing when Naaman was told to dip seven times to cure the leprosy. It was just water there too. Amen. But the fact that he was obedient to God, Amen. God changed his life. We'll do the same thing for you and I. Amen. We yield of ourselves and give our lives over to Him. He will change you from the inside out. Amen. And then from that point, we walk in the newness of life and remain faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verses number 10. I think we've gone long enough right now. We wanted to expand on this subject of the just shall live by faith. Amen. If you're here today, I'm going to ask for Jimmy to come back up. They're going to take some prayer requests and give an invitation song, and then uh, the service will be yours. Page 41, you can put